hostile Yankee turf, a Dodger manager laments a key decision of the 78 World Series. A dispute destined to be enshrined as another memorable World Series moment in this, the 75th anniversary of baseball's fall classic. Dodger faithful came hopeful that the Miracle Yankees and their new manager Bob Lemon would be subdued at last and that 1978 would bring redemption for their Dodgers and Tom Lasorda. <laughs> Captain Davy Lopes came dedicated to victory, not for his team alone, but for number 19, Jim Gilliam, his recently fallen friend who had long honored the Dodger uniform both as player and coach. Jim the fact that second baseman Davy Lopes had a superlative playoff series against the Phillies with five extra base hits was not surprising. Come on, Davey. Manager Lasorda and Dodger fans all believed that all Lopes right. was the ignition that made the Dodgers go. One for the devil, Davey. But now at age 32, newfound power merged with speed. When Lopes launched his second home run of game one, he proved that sometimes he was not only the Dodger ignition, but the accelerator as well. Playing like a man possessed, he knocked in five of the first six Los Angeles runs to send Dodger Stadium into emotional overdrive. After a subpar regular season, Dusty Baker's bat came to life in game one. Leading off the Dodgers second against Yankee starter Ed Figueroa, he connected for the first run of the game. It was the beginning of the end for the Yankees' 20-game winner, and the first of three hits for the rejuvenated Baker, whose power had slipped from 30 to 11 homers in 1978. Meanwhile, the reconstructed left arm of the bionic Tommy John forced the Yankees to beat the ball harmlessly into the turf. 18 of the first 23 putouts were ground balls. Working on his second straight postseason shutout, the veterans' off-speed stuff tantalized New York as he surrendered but two harmless hits over the first six innings. With a 7-0 lead, John seemed unbeatable. But Mr. October, Reggie Jackson, had singled in the second, and the crafty southpaw knew his big lead could disappear quickly against these Yankees. Tiring, John got a three-and-one pitch up. Up and out, way up. The blow's distance, more than its consequences, seemed to embarrass John. But the moment belonged to Reggie, who had now hit six home runs over his last four series games, breaking Yankee immortal Lou Gehrig's World Series record. When Tommy John weakened, another portsider, flame-throwing reliever Terry Forster, came in to strike out three of the five hitters he faced. He ended it with back-to-back -back whips of Paul Blair. And then Roy White. With an 11-5 victory, Tommy Lasorda was exuberant. His Dodgers now led one game to none. 
Game two. Dodger Stadium, where a healthy catfish hunter is a different pitcher than the man the Dodgers humbled last year. He coaxes a two to one lead into the sixth as he pitches against an old nemesis, Ron Say. Remembrance of things past, the penguin swallows the catfish once again. With this three-run shot and an earlier single in the fourth, Say knocked in all four Dodger runs. Hunter pitched well, but tonight Say owns Hunter, and seemingly that's enough. Except that the Dodger starter knuckle curve ace Bert Happy Hooten was in constant trouble. In the third inning, Jackson's up, Thurman Munson on first, Roy White on second. All right, Hooten, get tough. Jackson slashes a double to right. Reggie Smith bobbles the ball, allowing both runners to score. But the Yankees wouldn't score again until the seventh, when Hooten finally tires. Throwing good. I just trying to get the ball down that time. Still throwing good. You're still throwing good, huh? First two, three, huh? Yeah, well, that's back. It's only natural. All right, we're we'll bringing that in for the series, I guess. Beg pardon? We're just bringing that in for the series. You guys can all stay here all the oh, time. Oh, I don't know the rule on that. What I is that? You I, I say that's yeah. going to play. How's your brother Satch, Bill? Satch? Yeah, Hatch, yeah. Okay, you want these pictures? Uh, well, I haven't decided yet. Okay. I'll I mean, this is the World you Series. You've got to give me a little time. i got to make a decision here. But what do you think I should do? Take him out or leave him in? All right, I'm going to take him in. Who? Okay. Oh. Forster, the left-hander. A Yankee run in the seventh makes it 4-3 Dodgers. Now it's the ninth inning, and Bucky Dent opens with a single. But Dodger fans seem unfazed. Enter Wonderkin Bob Welch to center stage. A 21-year-old flamethrower just one year off the college campus. Reggie Jackson digs in. A classic ninth inning confrontation. Bucky Dent poised at second. Paul Blair at first. Two out. Mr. Cool, the kid with only half a season in the majors, against Mr. October, a 12-year veteran. Four foul balls, six minutes of classic nail-biting drama. Three. Strike three. The Dodgers win four to three. Delirium. Ecstasy. Anger. Frustration. And yet, even two games up, there's still that Bronx Stadium 3,000 miles away yet to conquer. Baseball fever. From the West Coast to the East, 40 million fans came out to the ballpark to catch it all year. And in New York, the Yankee fever was still alive. Over two million fans witnessed the incredible comeback all season. Now everyone wanted to see if the Yankees could do it again.
A pinstripe legend, Joe DiMaggio, throws out the first ball. Down two games to none, New York fans hope for the kind of comeback that has become the trademark of the 78 Yankees. And Don Sutton, the Yankees faced a pitcher with the most wins in Los Angeles Dodger history. But a Yankee veteran with a new lease on life was out to change that. On a day of free agents and changing faces, Roy White has spent 14 years in Yankee pinstripes. His homer in the first off Sutton was a reminder of just how much this quiet man has meant to Yankee continuity. With a 25 and 3 record, Ron Guidry quite simply had the greatest single season of any pitcher in Yankee history. But in game three, Guidry and even Dodger hero Davy Lopes were reduced to supporting players when the Yankees' Greg Nettles gave a pulsating, definitive seminar on the art of third base play. Watch. His acrobatics robbed Los Angeles of several hits and possibly some seven runs. Uncanny baseline smarts, Nettles performed his whirling dervish act not once, but twice with the bases loaded. Bob Lemon, quote, In 41 years, I've never seen anyone play third base better than that. Reggie Smith, quote, Nettles' performance was the turning point of the series. Best of all for the Yankees, Nettles did it when they desperately needed a win when Guidry, by his own admission, left his fastball in the bullpen. Houdini couldn't have done it better. It's said the test of a great pitcher is to win without his best stuff. Louisiana Lightning went the route while walking seven and striking out only four. But the Yankees won five to one and now trailed the Dodgers by only one game. Before game four, a low-keyed Greg Nettles looked human after all. Thanks to Nettles' magic glove, the 75th World Series had taken on a new dimension. But Tom Lasorda was determined not to let it bother his warriors. Let's go. Aggressive and determined. That's all. Good luck, David. Have a good day. Come on. Let's all have a good day. Something good is going to happen to you. When the dangerous Reggie Smith came to bat in the fifth, with Lopes on first and catcher Steve Yeager camped in second, Lasorda sounded like a prophet. A beleaguered Ed Figueroa might even say clairvoyant. Once Smith ripped him for a home run and a 3-0 Dodger lead. Could it be that Big Gun Smith and Steve Garvey would finally ignite? Regardless, with clutch pitcher Tommy John holding the Bronx Bombers at bay, it looks like Smith's opening salvo might be enough. Certainly Dodger infielder Ron Say's work at third base helped. Greg Nettles might have a patent on his magic act, but Say showed him some tricks of his own. Since the Dodgers' play at short and second had been less than spectacular, Say's proficiency at third and Steve Garvey's at first were critical. The Penguin might wobble, but he gets the job done. The Dodgers held their 3-0 lead into the sixth. But then White singled to extend his postseason hitting streak to nine games. And Munson walked. Then Reggie Jackson stepped in. Jackson had planted a Tommy John fastball over 400 feet in game one. This time, he stroked a clean single to right. A determined Roy White scored, and the Yankees were on their way back. Reggie on first. Thurman Musson on second. And Sweet Lou Pinella at the plate. Tommy John trying to hold a 3-1 lead. 
The stage is set for the biggest play of the series. Russell drops the line drive, gets the course at second, but hits Jackson with a relay to first, and Munson scores from second base. Sort of the very act of Jackson standing in the path of Russell's throw constituted interference. But National League umpire Frank Cooley ruled no wrongful intent, therefore no interference. The Yankees creep within a run. The lethal Thurman Munson at bat in the bottom of the eighth. One out. Colbert at second, thanks to his single and White's sacrifice bunt. Munson covers a double to left. And Blair races home to make it a 3-3 top. Rich Gossage, whose tireless right arm keyed the Yankees' late season comeback, makes his second strong relief appearance of the series. He scorches Dodger Reggie Smith. Then repeats the favor against the luckless Steve Garvey. Dodger Wonder Boy Bob Welch matches the Gossage heat. He burns nettles. A hurting Chris Chambliss feels the flame. Then it's pinch hitter Jim Spencer's turn. Extra innings, middle of the tenth. Still three to three. Welch fidgets because Jackson has singled, moving Roy White into scoring position. Reggie, who had been humbled by Welch in game two, calls time to give some advice to Lou Pinello, the next man up. Jackson returns to first base as the partisan crowd pleads, Lou, Lou, Lou. One of the game's best pure hitters waits. White tenses. Manila clubs a high fastball. Roy White scores the gamer, and the Yankees win four to three. The team that has returned from the dead so many times this year has done it again to deadlock the series at two games apiece. Poets say as the moon waxes and wanes, it plays funny tricks, even in World Series games. Watch. Spikes high, breeze on by. But never say die, here's mud in your eye. You find yourself all alone, crawling, crawling, crawling home. Hey, don't moan. You're not alone. Hold the phone. When you're in the middle of your action, sometimes it's smart to change your traction and get a different type of reaction. Go in places. <laughs> Feet and faces. Meeting in the strangest places.
That lasts. Poetry on the base paths, sometimes comic. Here's a fan who'd know, the king of comedy himself, Bob Hope, ready to throw out the first ball for game five. With the series tied, game five had to be the biggest challenge of young Jim Beatty's life. With eight series hits already, shortstop Bill Russell put Beatty to a third inning test. That man again, Davy Lopes on first. Russell gets his pitch. Lopes motors all the way from first. The throw is late, and the captain, who's played his heart out, scores to put the Dodgers ahead 2-0. Watson struggles to get his aching legs upright. Nothing new here. The man's played hurt all year. This grit symbolized the spirit of the incredible Yankee team comeback in 1978. Yankee stars had to play with pain over a long season. Talented reserves like Brian Doyle, subbing for the injured Willie Randolph, contributed to the Yankee team comeback with their aggressive play. It may have been the hard way, but it was working. It wasn't really that close. You could have come in the other way, really. Make sure you're all right, Brian. We've got plenty of time now. Get your breath. Heard or not, the Yankees never gave up, as Thurman Munson proved. Just when it looked like an injury might force him to the bench, the Yankee captain exploded with five RBIs in one game. But Munson had all kinds of pinstripe company, as the Yankees bruised Dodger pitching unmercifully. It didn't matter who served them up. 18 hits, 16 of them singles, a World Series record. Batting ninth shortstop Bucky Dent slept three hits and continued in the World Series what he had begun in postseason play. And if Bucky Dent was pleased, then Jim Beatty had to be ecstatic. The former Dartmouth basketball star had come far since that tear-filled June day when he lost to the Red Sox and was shipped to the minors. When he grabbed Bill Russell's comebacker to end game five, he had pitched his first complete major league game ever and sent his team back to Dodger Stadium with a 3-2 to two series lead. Back to L.A. for Game 6, where over 3 million Dodger fans caught baseball fever during the regular season and established a new attendance record. Former Dodger great Duke Snyder and these fans honestly felt their home field meant salvation. Many thought the Dodgers would cut Catfish Hunter around one more time. No better place to start than with the irrepressible Davy Lopes leading off. Up, up, and away. Goodbye. The catfish looked like he might be in for a quick hook when Lopes homered. They could only hope that their captain had finally righted the listing Dodger ship. But Hunter, like many successful control pitchers, was notorious for giving up homers early and then playing hard to get. Once he settled into his groove, the North Carolina farmer could still be stingy when it counted. But the Yankees had two big surprises. Brian Doyle, an unknown rookie when the World Series began, and Bucky Dent, who had suffered through an injury-prone, disappointing regular season. Although batting eighth and ninth in the order, Doyle and Dent produced 17 base hits. And defensively, they flat out played the Dodgers up the middle, no question.
Who in their wildest Walter Mitty fantasies would have envisioned this? Beatty, even Hunter, unlikely heroes. But Doyle and Dent, they had a besieged Tommy Lasorda muttering to himself. Who is that? Ty Trainer or Paul Wainer? The two guys must have seven pence between them. You could hardly blame Tom Lasorda, Mr. Optimism, for his disappointment. It had to be tough to see it all slip away for yet another year. And this time in front of his hometown fans. It was most disheartening for Lasorda and Dodger race Don Sutton. A portrait of a losing team's frustration. A winning team's elation. Even laconic Bob Lemon was on cloud nine. His Yankees had become the first team to win four straight after losing the first two. Bar bar your mirror, I'll come back and pitch. <laughs> mirror, mirror on the wall, which star glitters brightest of them all? Is it Reggie Jackson who got sweet revenge against Bob Welch by pulverizing a fastball to close out the Yankees' 7-2 win? Granted, Mr. October lived up to his name, but in this 75th anniversary of the World Series, there were other stars who glittered brightly as well. Captain Davy Lopes bedeviled the Yankees with his newfound power stroke. Other Dodgers also sparkled, most notably Ron Say, whose defensive gems and timely swings gave the Dodgers an early edge. But once again, the Yankee stars eclipsed the Dodger victory hopes. Sparked by the play of Craig Nettles at third, the 78 Yankee mirror caught the light of other heroes. Resilient Goose Gossage pitched shutout ball while stifling the Dodgers three separate times. Catfish Hunter pitched like the living embodiment of Yankee resurgence. Herman Munson used his bat and his typical true grit in the field to say, I'm still here. While a late bloomer rookie pitcher Jim Beatty announced with his right arm, hey, I've arrived. World Series pressure lifted Brian Doyle to a performance he understandably called the greatest experience of my life. Days earlier, when Bucky Dent inched his three-run homer over Fenway's left field wall, to win the crucial playoff game against the Red Sox. It was like an omen for this Yankee team that had scratched its way back from oblivion. A foretelling of a time when this same Bucky Dent would prophetically win the MVP award in this, the 75th anniversary of Baseball's Fall Classic. <laughs>